and uh, invite uh, Professor Satyajit Mayer for his talk. Uh, we're now all set to hear about the fascinating cell membrane. But you know, before I begin, um, let, me, let me say that I owe a lot to the, uh, well, to the Wellcome Trust, first of all, um, for supporting me as an early career uh, fellow. Um, well, sorry, wasn't an early career fellow. Was a senior international investigator when I first came, came back to work in India. So my association with the Wellcome Trust and its uh, incredibly uh, generous and open-ended funding um, began um, you know, in the early 2000s. Um, subsequently, the India Alliance came about. And um, you know, since I was so, uh, um, so grateful to the trust for having put their faith in the research that we do or we have done, um, I, I was uh, in, you know, involved in many of, the, uh, many of the efforts of the India Alliance in the beginning and, um, and subsequently. Uh, and you know, have watched the India Alliance uh, uh, take off in, a, in an incredibly exciting way and, and felt uh, that uh, after having contributed some, some of my time on many of the committees, I, I felt that uh, I could also uh, indulge myself in, um, in approaching them for a fellowship, uh, at perhaps, which is perhaps the last fellowship of, of uh, uh, possible in the in the um, India Alliance's portfolio, the Mark Darshi Fellowship, and um, to my well surprise, as as, uh, as Akhilesh also indicated, um, the uh, I was given the fellowship after a great deal of discussion um, in the committee, and um, <clears throat> but I must say uh, the uh, it has been quite amazing. I'm not going to speak about what I have achieved in my fellowship. I'm going to tell you something about, something about the, the science that we do. Um, but I would like to make uh, one uh, gesture, and that is, I'm sure that will be shared by all of our fellows. Uh, when I came to this meeting, uh, um, Shahid uh, asked, he said, you know, I'm going to ask you for a favor. And you know, you know, when, some, when the guy who runs the fellowship scheme says, I'm going to ask you for a favor, you don't say no. <laughs> and so I said, what is it, Shahid? And, um, and, you know, uh, and Shahid, we have, come, uh, we have uh, uh, done what you asked us for. Uh, so on behalf of all the fellows and of India Bioscience, Lakshmi, uh, we'd like to present you with some mangoes from Bangalore. <laughs> it's you know it's an extraordinary uh, effort. Uh, they're all they're all organically grown in GKVK right next to NCBS. So you know um, you know it's it's uh, you know it's an incredible thing to have Shahid as uh, as the India Alliance. Uh, um, head, and also to look forward to the new innings of the India Alliance and what it can do with additional funding from, from the government, I, and I hope that continues. And I hope India Alliance continues beyond the five years uh, in whatever avatar it may take, but it's, an, it's a very important uh, organization for supporting science in the country, perhaps one of the few that delivers money on time. Uh, many of you will know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So anyway, so I hope this is not going to count in my time, but I'm just going to start uh, my, uh, my talk about uh, what I'm here on this podium to, uh, to give this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's the skin, uh, to tell you something about the skin of a cell. Uh, and, and what, I mean, the skin of a cell is, is essentially what uh, I'm beginning to call the membrane of a living cell. And this has come about because we've been able to image uh, the living cell membrane. Uh, and imaging the living cell membrane has revealed that it's a functional active membrane composite. And, and you know, these are words, but I'm going to unpack them as we go along and tell you, tell you exactly what, what I mean uh, by that. Because it's, it's something that you know, we've come about by, uh, through an engagement with just watching what happens inside a living cell or at the surface of a living cell. Uh, 
So uh, many of you would have seen this uh, picture of a neutrophil taken from a movie um, by the late David Rogers at Vanderbilt University, um, now part of many textbooks. It's a neutrophil running after, running after a bacterium. You know, incredibly important. If it didn't do this, none of us would be sitting here, given all the bugs that uh, we heard about a little while ago from Achilles. Um, so this neutrophil now has engulfed that bacterium, uh, but it has really purposefully gone after that little creature. Uh, and uh, the point I'm trying to make is that this neutrophil has gone after this little creature because the membrane of the cell, not the DNA, not anything else, the membrane of the cell is able to sense where this bacterium is. Uh, the membrane of the cell is actually looking at the, this bacterium, looking at its, uh, what do you call it? Uh, oops, where is that? Ah, yeah, here you go. There's a new, new toy that I got, uh, which, um, which is now watching the bacterium and engaging with both physical and mechanical cues to go and trap this bacterium. It, physical cues are coming from its environment. It's avoiding all the blood. Uh, and the chemical cues are coming from the bacteria. So how does the membrane actually sense this? And this is because this, the membrane senses this by actually engaging in, uh, in, a, uh, in trans, trans, uh, transferring the information for the bacteria to the inside of the cell uh, at the, in real time and modifying the experience of the cell so that it can go and engage with this bacteria. So one, one needs to understand what is this membrane? What is this membrane? How is this little four nanometer piece of fluid, lip, uh, fluid bilayer able to, uh, in, in fact, extract all this information from the outside world? So, uh, so if you just look at a cell, cell in a dish, a very unhealthy looking cell, it's got all these spikes, but it still has a membrane. Uh, the membrane of the cell uh, for many years has been thought of as a fluid bilayer, four nanometer thick, um, with two leaflets, uh, millions of different molecules, uh, uh, millions of molecules, thousands of different uh, species of lipids and proteins, uh, arranged presumably in a, in a random manner, thermodynamically uh, equilibrated. Because this is the impression of the, of the membrane that we, we all have, and actually I, I had too. Uh, when I started looking at the membrane of a living cell. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in subsequently, from the, uh, from the 70s onwards, uh, we've modified our view of the membrane. And this is a view of the membrane in the, in the beginning of this century, 2000, um, uh, a, a review from uh, one of my colleagues, Michael Edidin, uh, where he says the membrane is actually a patchwork quilt of different sorts of lipidic environments that the, that the cell uh, that the cell has actually created for itself, or the cell generates. These lipidic environments have been thought to come, have come about by, uh, and, in, in, and, and have been termed in common parlance, membrane rafts, if you will. Um, and uh, what I'd like to argue is that the cell is actually engineering this lipidic environment molecule by molecule. And, and the story I'm going to tell you about this afternoon is about how the cell is engineering this lipidic environment. It is, it is not using you know, standard uh, equilibrium-based separation, phase separation methods in this complex mixture, but it's actually uh, literally putting molecules, uh, well, I should say brick, shouldn't say brick by brick, but molecule by molecule into place. Um, so what we'd like to understand is the rules and principles behind how this local regulated organization works and how that can inform the cell of, of, in fact, how it can go after running after a, a bacterium in this very complicated external environment. Um, and, uh, and of course, those are the consequences of having such, a, such an enriched, uh, enriched uh, surface or skin, if you will, to engage with. So the, the, our journey into studying this uh, membrane started uh, many years ago. Uh, when, of course, this was the model that we had in front of us, and we wanted to interrogate this model of a, of a patchwork quilt of, of molecules in, in, the, uh, in a living cell membrane. Um, so to do that, we put in uh, a few, um, I'll borrow a term from Akhilesh, a few detectives. Uh, and these were proteins uh, which were anchored to, uh, to lipid, um, uh, lipid molecules, proteins that were anchored to, whoops, it's all over the place, this device. 
the proteins that were anchored to the membrane via uh, glycolipids. And those glycolipids now have, um, have long saturated acyl chains on them. And these were GPI anchored proteins. I mean, they're present everywhere in, in, your, in the eukaryotic uh, uh, um, uh, sphere of life. Uh, on every cell that has, um, uh, that is a eukaryote, carries these GPI anchored proteins. So we put uh, fluorescent tags on these GPI anchored proteins and began to observe the distribution of these GPI anchored proteins. If the membrane were a fluid bilayer where things were happily uh, swimming around, uh, well equilibrated, these molecules would have told us exactly that. They would have told us that, that they were randomly dispersed on the surface of these cells. Um, but to, but, to, but if, you, if you notice the scale bar here, it's, it's five nanometers. And to, and to ask whether these molecules were randomly dispersed on the surface of the cells, we needed to look at these molecules in living cells at that resolution. So to do this, we built some technology many years ago. Um, this was a technology that uh, wasn't available at that time, uh, to image molecules in the living state at five nanometer resolution. Um, and actually ask whether another molecule was present next to it at five nanometer resolution. And in fact, we uh, 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 used a method that um, we pioneered uh, to uh, look at the interaction between fluorophores at five nanometer resolution. I'm not going to go into the details of that method, except to say that uh, if you, if you um, in this next view graph, uh, if you look at the fluorescence distribution of a GPI anchor protein, here is a GPI anchor protein attached to GFP. Uh, its distribution is uniformly boring. It doesn't look like, it's like this fantastic mosaic uh, that I described to you. In fact, if, the, if those mosaic structures were present, the GPI anchor protein should have looked in this clumpy distribution uh, that those mosaics uh, gave us. But they look very uniformly boring. But when we switched on our proximity imaging uh, tool, you, we got this incredibly rich looking picture where you had, uh, where you had uh, all these different hues, uh, which suggested, uh, suggested, and I'm going to uh, again tell you what these hues indicate. These uh, hues, uh, if you look at a little patch of membrane there, these hues uh, tell us that uh, GPI anchored proteins in these deep blue uh, regions are present in these extremely clustered patches in the membrane uh, in regions where you have uh, yellow, uh, hues, the GPI anchor proteins are sitting there monomeric and dispersed. So the presence of these uh, uh, proteins in these, um, in these extremely, uh, sorry, extremely dispersed uh, 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 states, in the presence of highly clustered states of GPI anchor proteins was extraordinarily unusual. Uh, I mean, we, in a membrane, you should not be seeing this. I mean, this here you have a lipid anchored molecule on the outer leaflet of the cell present in these tiny clusters in the membrane of a living cell. So this itself said that something unusual was going on. And if he could map the, map the cell membrane in these blue and yellow uh, or red pixels, uh, where blue represents highly clustered, yellow or red represents unclustered, uh, we should be able to get a sense of what the cell membrane is doing in, in space and time. Um, and it turned out <clears throat> that uh, the, this heterogeneity that we were observing was, uh, you know, was observed you know, uh, in, a, in our lab for the first time. And when we mapped this heterogeneity, <clears throat> this heterogeneity of distribution of clusters and monomers, uh, they, they had very unusual modes. So as, as, a, as a physical chemist would describe this, these structures were incredibly improbable if you had a membrane was if you had a fluid bilayer in which molecules were, were happily distributed in a random fashion. And they should not be happening. Um, not, not only were our methods um, so, uh, revealing such heterogeneities, but, but subsequently m many, many different techniques, especially the new super resolution techniques that became available to us in this, in, literally in this, uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, have now revealed the, that these GPI anchor proteins are sitting clustered in the cell membrane. But I must say the, the, the experiments that we had done were in, were in living membranes. And I think that provided us a very special, uh, a very special uh, uh, glimpse of what was happening in the live cell. Um, <clears throat> so um, you know, there are so, all sorts of uh, um, uh, uh, properties of these clusters, which, uh, which now um, 
re have revealed to us a very uh, special characteristic, which I'm just going to now indicate uh, in one uh, movie here, uh, where what you see in green are GFP, GPI, when the cell makes these blebs, so every cell, if you bring them down onto a surface in, when they're in solution, first make these little blebs. And in these blebs, the GPI anchored proteins are present as very diffuse monomers. And ex experiments like this indicated to us that the clusters of these GPI anchored proteins were being maintained when the membrane was in fact in contact with the rest of the cell. And and what is the rest of the cell that the membrane is in contact with? And that's the actin cytoskeleton. The, the cytoskeletal of the, of the, of the membrane um, of the cell is um, actually supporting this, this uh, four nanometer fluid bilayer. And when the cell membrane engages with this four nanometer fluid bilayer, these clusters appear to form. Uh, but at that time when we were making these measurements, and had encountered the, the possibility that the clusters of these GPI anchored proteins, remember they are outer leaflet lipid anchored molecules, uh, engaging with the clusters of, uh, uh, engaging with the cytoskeletal at the inner, inner leaflet, uh, when they were, were uh, uh, when the membrane was connecting to the cytoskeleton, what we knew is that diffusion of proteins in the membrane was affected by this engagement with the cytoskeleton. But, but the structure of the of molecules and their organization should, in principle, not be affected by this by the cytoskeletal armature that was present underneath the membrane. And, at the, and a, a lot of this work was, uh, was something that um, uh, myself and uh, a physicist colleague of mine, Madan, uh, Madan Rao, were discussing and we were looking at the analysis of all these of all these distributions of these molecules in the membrane, when his student Kripa came up to us and said, look, you guys keep talking, but I'm going to tell you how these clusters might form. And, and what she found, and what she, you know, being a physicist, she just, she just said, well, let's, you know, let's, being a theorist, I must say, not, not just a physicist, but, but not an experimentalist, but a theorist, she said, well, let's consider, for example, that you have in this complex actin cortex, one more layer of complexity, that is you have filaments of short actin and motor proteins that are engaging with each other. Uh, and if that happens, you will generate these tight clusters of actin uh, driving, being driven into these little aster-like configurations. And these aster-like configurations are essentially creating these clusters of molecules in the membrane. Of course, being a physicist and a theorist, you have the liberty to uh, postulate anything you want. Uh, <laughs> but as a biologist, we had to we had to ask ourselves: Is this is this you know is any of this possible? And what Kripa did was provided a incredibly coherent uh, um, uh, uh, sort of theoretical uh, explanation for all the experiments that we had done. The quantitative aspects of our experiments were completely explained by the by the theoretical predictions that she, uh, she, had, she had done. In fact, what she produced was this little view graph for us, which actually convinced me that, that, uh, that, we were, that she was on the right track. What she's showing us here are clusters of these uh, little asters being formed in space and time. And that's precisely what we were seeing in our experiments. So given that she had proposed this, what we thought at that time was an outlandish idea, we decided to look for these little filaments of actin in the membrane. And, and that's literally the model that uh, Kripa put together. I mean, it doesn't require sophisticated cartoons to, to tell us that, uh, that this is what we should be looking for. Um, and, and when we went uh, looking for these actin filaments, in fact, when I say we, it was Su Suvrajit uh, Saha in my lab and Thomas uh, Van Zanten. When they started looking for these molecules in my lab, they found them. They found them um, you know, in, in great abundance, that you have these short filaments of actin sitting underneath the membrane, templating, if you will, structures in the membrane that could, could contribute to the patterning that we were seeing. OK, so um, uh, you know, bear with me with all this, because this is going to end up in, in some, some uh, serious consequences for the cell membrane. And, uh, and I'm going to uh, take you through some of the, some of the uh, observations that, 
have led to those, will, have, will lead us to those consequences. So, uh, so essentially what we dis dis decided at that time, based on all the theory and the experiments, that we are looking at a membrane which is being templated by the active mechanics of actomyosin. Um, and this uh, membrane templated by the active mechanics of uh, actomyosin uh, contributes to uh, a composite, if you will, of a membrane sitting, you know, being driven by the modes of actin activity happening underneath it. Right. So, um, <clears throat> so, but you must remember that the GPI anchor proteins that we were working with, these uh, structures down here, uh, they sit at the outer leaflet and our actin is operating at the inner leaflet. So how does that, how does that connection being made? And there, um, we worked with uh, a really uh, amazing chemist, Ram Vishwakarma, at, at uh, the IIIM in Jammu in Kashmir, uh, where he has labs. Uh, he built these lipids of different chain lengths, and, uh, which allowed us to, uh, to make the following statement, that the, the GPI anchor proteins were connected to the actomyosin machinery within a leaflet through their interactions across the bilayer uh, in a manner which uh, which uh, creates little patches of membrane, of liquid ordered membrane uh, at the sites where the actomyosin is engaging with the membrane. So at those sites, uh, you, the, the GPI anchor proteins build these little liquid ordered domains in the membrane. Of course, if, um, and we, we did some uh, all atom simulations of the structures of the lipids at the outer leaflet and the inner leaflet uh, in the presence of, of cholesterol and th those indicated to us that, that these little nanodomains were, were being formed. Um, so we looked for these nanodomains, and sure enough, uh, here again, uh, Subrajit uh, uh, ex explored the membrane with new probes that we had built to, uh, to look at the ordered regions of the membrane. And what he found uh, was that the places where the GPI anchor proteins were forming these clusters, those patches in the membrane, in fact, uh, were patches where ordered domains were being built. So this, uh, again, convinced us that what we had, what we had discovered was a, uh, was a, very, a very general characteristic of the membrane, uh, and that we could actually maybe generalize this into a, into a, a new model for a membrane uh, uh, from these sorts of observations. So, so we, we put forward the idea that the cell membrane is indeed uh, a membrane actin uh, cortex composite, where one can think of three classes of proteins. One, of course, that corresponds to the, uh, you know, the diffuse, the, the uh, well-equilibrated single Nicholson type of, mem uh, of membrane component, where the molecules are indeed well mixed. There's another class which is entrained by these actomycin machineries, perhaps not just entrained by the actomycin machineries, but could also be entrained by, by activities that come from the outside of the cell. Uh, and, and that class of molecules uh, were a separate class that we call the passive class. And there's a third class that we, based on these observations, and that energy was being consumed to create these structures, we uh, I mean, didn't take us much time to postulate that there must be a third class. And I think this is the most important class, a third class of molecules that we call the active class, which indeed regulates this whole system. So, and so, uh, I mean, again, this was uh, driven by the idea that if these structures are being created because of the consumption of ATP, uh, actomycin is, of course, a hugely ATP-intensive uh, uh, system, so if they must also be regulated. Um, so we started looking for these regulators, and the first regulator we came across was the integrins, and now if you think back to the moving cell, moving cells require their integrins to be engaged, um, and these integrins are, are things that can drive, if you will, the changes in these membrane organizations. So integrins, in principle, uh, have the following uh, activities that they engage with in the um, inside of the cell. They engage with uh, adapter molecules. They engage with uh, the uh, actin binding proteins. They engage with kinases, GTPases, actin nucleators, and myosin regulators. All the necessary ingredients for, our, for, our, um, uh, for creating these patterns in the membrane. So with that uh, uh, hypothesis, we went about looking for, the, looking for uh, you know, reasons to um, um, come, come, to this, uh, uh, come to this conclusion. And uh, what, we, uh, what we did, when I say we, it's Joey, 
uh, what he did was he um, put cells down uh, in, which were in suspension onto surfaces that had integrin ligands, the fibronectin, for example, fibronectin. And sure enough, the, the cell membranes now suddenly begin to exhibit this blue aspect. So, uh, uh, so what he discovered was that there's a whole signaling uh, pathway that, uh, that you can see on this, uh, on this slide here that starts with the integrins at the, uh, at the top and then uh, you know, enters uh, the signaling cascade of integrins leading to the generation of a, uh, a, an actin filament and myosin motors. Whoops. Uh, so, uh, so now um, we find that uh, well, this, this uh, monitor seems to say 15, 58 seconds to explode. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. It says something very funny. But, uh, but anyway, so, so, the, so the idea uh, uh, is, is that we've now established a, a completely detailed molecular machinery for signaling receptors to engage with this actomyosin templating mechanism beneath. Um, and uh, that signaling machinery uh, in, involves integrins of different flavors. The signaling, uh, for example, fibronectin receptors activate such a signaling system. Uh, other uh, ligands of integrins, laminin, collagen, vitronectin, in fact, do the opposite. They inhibit such a signaling, signaling mechanism. Um, but then Joey decided to do uh, what you know, one should never do, which is one more experiment. Um, and what he did was, was he, he went and put the cells on a fluid bilayer, uh, which had integrin ligands on it. And he found that now the cells activated the integrins, but did not make any of these changes in the membrane that we were looking at. When the membrane was actually coming down on a glass surface that had been coated with fibronectin. Fortunately, he did these experiments in the lab of a collaborator in, uh, uh, in, um, in Singapore. And then when he came back, uh, he came back with slides which had, uh, which had bilayers that had some, some uh, defects in them or some little uh, chromium little pillars that we actually engineered as defects. Uh, and those, those pillars now trapped the integrin ligand. Uh, and the trapped integrin ligands now dramatically activated the membrane uh, and its reorganization at the sites of activation. This indicated to us that the, uh, the integrin system, when I say us, it was uh, Ambika. Uh, she uh, said, well, you know, integrin activates a whole uh, cascade of mechanochemical transducers. Uh, the, the integrins now activate a, uh, because of their engagement and, and uh, uh, ex uh, exerting some force on the, on the surface, they activate these mechanochemical transducers uh, like vinculin. And vinculin now uh, generates a mechanical signal that gates the production of these specialized membrane domains. So, um, so I'm not going to take you through the details of this, except to uh, now summarize for you that uh, upon activation from receptors or these active molecules like, like um, integrins, the, the cell membrane is modified in the vicinity of these receptors by both chemical and physical cues that are being sensed by, by proteins uh, at those locations. Now, of course, you know, this all sounds very well and, of course, it can get published. Uh, but then, you know, why should the care cell care about this at all? Right? I mean, I told you that the cell is acting as an adaptive sensorium. The cell membrane is acting as an adaptive sensorium. But how does this contribute to that? To that sort of activity. So to, to ask that question, of course, we, we needed to perturb the, the, the way the cell is actually uh, generating this, this sort of a uh, patterning uh, mechanism. And here again, uh, we, um, we uh, uh, had some clues from the time course uh, of the generation of these, of these structures in the membrane. What we found was that the cells, in fact, uh, produce these uh, clusters just before they exhibited an explosive spreading uh, activity. Okay, so, um, and he, sort of some quanti quantification to, to confirm that. Um, and then we disturbed the production of those little uh, clusters of GPI anchor proteins by using uh, mutants that 
prevented the expansion of, this, of the chain lengths of those GPI anchor proteins. And uh, we used cells that were no longer able to build these clusters in the membrane. And those cells now, uh, if you look at them from, from a perspective of, of the spreading reaction, they, um, they uh, I guess I don't even have to show you what, what mutants, uh, what the mutants are, or tell you which ones are the mutants. So the ones on the left, of course, are the wild type cells. The ones on the right are cells that have been rescued, where the mutants have been rescued, and the ones in the middle are cells that just simply cannot spread. So, so putting all this together, uh, we, um, uh, we actually figured out how the cell uses some of these uh, patterning machineries in order to execute some function. So the cell, in fact, uh, upon engagement with their ligand, uh, generates, a, generates this reorganization of the membrane. That reorganization of the membrane, in turn, recruits a machinery, which then uh, activates the next step in the spreading of, these, uh, of, the, of the cell, because the integrin receptor recruits a machinery that's, that's uh, dependent on the production of these domains for their spreading reaction. Um, the spreading reaction is, is again, an actin-based reaction, which is coupled to molecules that sense the change in the membrane order. And therefore, this, this cascade of activities from integrin receptor signaling to the spreading of the cell or cell migration is directly coupled to the modification of the membrane of these living cells. Um, uh, this would uh, not be that interesting if it were only, only the integrin receptors that were doing this. Um, in fact, uh, I've just got a, uh, one more slide. Uh, yeah. So uh, the integrin receptors now um, uh, act, uh, act as, uh, if you will, an exemplar of many signaling receptors that sculpt their membrane for such functional purposes. Many different signal receptors activate the same sorts of machineries and in, indeed will modify the membrane in, in precisely the same ways. And, and they will engage in specific kinds of crosstalk using the membrane as an adaptive, uh, uh, as an adaptive sort of surface. So um, uh, uh, here's one example. Uh, the signaling outcomes, uh, in fact, of a GPCR are also modified by, by precisely the same sort of uh, membrane environments that, that the integrin receptors can regulate. Um, in, I, I'm, again, not going to show much more detail, but just now summarize uh, for you what, what I think we've found um, is that the cell surface is a finely tuned actin membrane composite. It's a living, breathing skin that drapes the cell, and it consumes energy in a, in a manner that creates sort of this ad adaptive sensorium. There are extraordinary properties of such an adaptive sensorium that we are exploring. I mean, they have implications for a number of different, uh, in a, for a number of different contexts. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, I'd just like to leave you with one um, uh, idea that, that what we are seeing is a exquisite orchestration of the regulation of membrane organization through, a, through these signal dependent machineries, which in turn feed back onto the functions of these different molecules. Uh, there are a number of, of course, open questions, but, but I think this, this observation uh, for changes the way we look at uh, that flimsy little four nanometer bilayer and now consider, consider it as a living, breathing uh, entity that, that uh, is able to modify itself in real time and modify the functions of molecules that are present within it. So I'm just going to leave you here with a uh, um, uh, with an acknowledgement slide of all the different people who uh, helped out, uh, in this uh, journey. But I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out some key people who've been part of this work. Joseph Matthew, Thomas uh, Zantin, Chandrima, uh, Subrajit, uh, and uh, uh, a number of, uh, and, and Ria, who were essentially the architects of, of the work that I've shown you this afternoon. Um, Collaborations, without collaborations, none of this would have happened. Ram Vishwakarma, a brilliant chemist, and Madan Rao, an uh, extraordinary soft matter physicist, have been part of this journey right from the beginning, and um, nothing would have happened without their engagement. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Jitu, for the very nice story.